Well, you've given us, the, I mean, I don't know, I'm not trying to speak for the audience, but I've, you've given us a very fresh look at all of this, and it's, I'm a little troubled by some of it. Uh, but I want to ask you a question. I know the audience has some questions. Sure. But, I mean, so, if I get it right, so during this period, the young Roosevelt, 24, 25, 26, who comes out here, is characterized by some rather conventional thinking of the time. And to our way of thinking, it, it feels a little illiberal and bigoted, but, yes. but he's caught up in, in what you're calling the tropes that were common among sure. certain parts of, of the American population. And he comes here to get to something that he feels is disappearing or that he can get a transfusion of out here that's no longer available somewhere else. Yes. But then somehow, and you haven't gone into much detail about this later, there's a maturation process where he becomes less caught up in these ideas and, and thinks them more, has some original thoughts about them and winds up being a leader of a country that moves into the 20th century. So yes. is that fair so far? Yes. So two things. First of all, what do you think that maturation process looked like? And I know you're not a Roosevelt biographer or scholar. And then what does this sojourn here, what does it really amount to in Roosevelt's life? A couple of questions. Um, the first place I think you've got to look at the, those years, those critical years, uh, early after, he, after his time in, in Cuba. Uh, you can look at those critical years when he becomes, when he moves into real power. For example, in this question, this whole question of Indians, Roosevelt and Indians. Uh, I think that for the, for the first time that Roosevelt really came to um, connect to, or became to had any uh, really significant exposure to what it was like to be an Indian in America, and the kinds of the kinds of issues that they were faced, was ironically after he went back east. It was when he was governor of New York. And if you look through his correspondence, you see him writing about the, uh, the, you know, the difficulties of the remaining, the surviving reservations out there. And he becomes a, a great advocate of uh, trying to clean up the corruption in those places. He begins to get an understanding of what, the, of what that was. I think that uh, over time, especially as president, as he became, uh, as he became increasingly involved with the kinds of other kinds of uh, other kinds of, of political issues that dealt directly with these questions uh, of race, uh, I think he began to get. Uh, if you look at his correspondence, you look at his letters, you begin to get a real, a real sense, uh, a real sense of that. And of course, in terms of the economic issues, uh, it's his exposure to the realities of that and the realities of power, when, especially those individuals dealing with him. Uh, he's no longer a you know, playing cowboy out there in Medora. Uh, he's now he's now um, you know having conversations with J.P. Morgan, uh, and when you begin to have those kinds of conversations, that kind of exposure, then your whole understanding of what this what the kind of uh, the kind of power this is and what it means in terms of the uh, of the of the American people that um, that takes a very sharper turn. Yeah, well, that makes sense, and I, I reckon that you would say something like that. But then, what do you make of his errand into the wilderness? <laughs> You know that uh, I have to say at the end of this, this uh, I look back on that, and that was my that was my great question as well. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, let's let's face it, Roosevelt was just sort of uh, he was described as pure act, you know, and uh, uh, he was not a man um, that I'm aware of at least uh, that was very reflective about you know looking looking back on this. And if I I guess if, you know those fantasy experiences we have, you want to you know, sit down with him uh, over dinner, you know, that's the kind of question I would I would like to ask. I alluded to that briefly when I said, does he ever did he ever realize, you know, as he's as he's trying to wrestle through the Hepburn Act, you know, <laughs> did he ever realize, looking back on this, you know, why didn't I see that? You know, that was in fact exactly the world uh, that I was living in out there. Uh, but that's just not the kind of thing that he did. So I think it, it, it has to remain uh, mostly just a question of speculation. What, how he how he went back on that so. Let me ask it in a slightly different way, and then we'll turn to the audience, but. You know, in 1910, he came to Fargo, North Dakota, and he said famously, yes. I would never have been president of the United States had it not been for my time in North Dakota. We North Dakotans take that pretty seriously. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I believe we require all young North Dakotans to memorize that at birth. So, <laughs> so for us, th this is our mythology of Roosevelt, that, uh -huh. that he got something here that then propelled him into national greatness, and it wasn't just a cowboy mythology, it was something that he learned here, it was something mm -hmm. that he absorbed in seeing this country, working with common people, with rugged individuals. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm asking you whether you need to disabuse us of that myth. 
No, no, I see, I see no reason for that at all. I think he, he certainly learned plenty, learned plenty out here. I think um, what I hear, hear that quote, you know, you, you hear that, I've heard that many times. When I hear that quote, I, I think of it primarily in personal terms. One of those, one of those occasions when he did you know, sort of, you know, get personal and remember about that. I think what he's saying is, you know, I, I was, uh, it was my time out here that was, uh, that healed the wound. Uh, and that it wasn't so much that I, so much the lessons that I learned, although I'm sure there were plenty. It was rather the fact that I was able to get my sense of myself back together uh, and to uh, to heal enough to go back and do what I needed to do. Well, let me just try one more time. I, I, I want you to I want you to solve this problem for us. But I can't. <laughs> how does a person who comes into a backward-looking atavism uh -huh. go on to become a person who carries the country, sometimes kicking and screaming, into modernity? <laughs> I mean, what, what? There's a paradox here, right? There is. There is a paradox. So what? That, I mean, really, what I mean, do you make of it? All I can say is just stated. That's that's what I came away with, came away with here. What we see here is you know this uh, this young man out here um, sort of misreading so much of what he sees. Um, uh, and yet we follow him forward and we see him so different in his attitudes. You know, what happens in between, how he resolves that paradox, you know, I, I don't know. Well, the Eastern Establishment of the Western Experience. Perhaps we'll get some <laughs> more thoughts on it tomorrow. Questions for our distinguished keynote speaker. Yes, speak up, please. Um, I, I was thinking that it, it could be out here in, in the West where uh, as, a, uh, as, as an individual, you know, uh, from, from an aristocratic family in a sense, you really came into contact with basically, you know, the common people uh, for the first time uh, to, to a great extent that, you know, ordinary people were not his fellow aristocrats, definitely. And this would later be emphasized as he went on, you know, as police commissioner in New York. Sure. You're dealing with, you know, uh, you, you know, in his class, you wouldn't have been a lot of Catholics with police commissioner and also everybody, every other ethnic group was pouring into New York at that time. Yeah. And that would be the army after that. And he began, perhaps he began to you know, stretch sort of a, a common, you know, common threat between all this, you know, all these places that might be one So the possibility that... The it sort of begins here in the West, you know, mm -hmm. it really hangs out for long periods of time. This experience as a window on common men and women's yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, that makes I mean it makes perfect sense, and and again I think it builds upon the, uh, when he as you said when he goes out uh, when he goes into the army, uh, and again the, the the irony here is that it's not until he goes back east, you know, that he sees confirm some of the things I think he saw beginning that he began to uh, begin to see out here. Yeah. Other questions? If I don't see you, just speak up. Someone out here. Just to follow up, I was just thinking that when he came out here. He had to prove himself to them. He was this aristocrat, you know, and four eyes and all, all those other things. And they're like, disdain for him. But he proved himself. And time and time again, we see throughout his dealings with people of different races that he said he sees their individual qualities and says, you know, wow, if, you know, everybody was like this, this person, like Booker T. Washington, as an example, then, you know, you know, then they would be perfectly you know, in the modern society. Well, there are two things there. One is that Roosevelt had to prove himself right. to people in his, his aristocratic roots in his Harvard education and all of those things that were great badges of respectability in New York were actually detriments out here and he yes. managed to yes. want to overcome that so that's a character question yeah. but also that he went on to find this Indian or that black person admirable but not so much Indianness or African Americanness as a larger tribal entity. Yeah, I mean, my own my own impression of that is that the first part of that I think is more uh, has has more to say to it uh, than the second, um, and that's part of what I was saying. I think when he says I wouldn't be president if it weren't for North Dakota, I think that's the kind of thing that he was talking about. It Having was, to overcome. So, it's, yes, it was this uh, sort of you know facing down uh, not just the tragedy back east, but you know but facing down these kinds of these kinds of um, impressions people had of him. Uh, this kind of individual overcoming these individual pro situations. Uh, that brought out things, I think, that gave him the kind of uh, self-confidence, that gave him the kind of, uh, of gravity that he would need when he went back east. Uh, the other, I think, again, I think it was really more the case when he, when he had to go east, you know, and began to wrestle with these sorts of questions, that I think he came around to those sorts of, those sorts of positions, yeah. Other thoughts? Yes, here? Thank you very much, Dr. West, for coming out. Really 
said. You're quite welcome. Yeah, what a what a fascinating, fascinating point. Yes, right, right. What a, yeah, really is reflected in what you have said about his experience here in the that he has that coming down from being part of the elite to yeah. being a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. What a what a what a great expression of Western common sense. You know, what a what a what a what a nutty idea that we uh, you know that, that a a prerequisite for becoming president is something that I don't change. I don't change my mind. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't come to believe different things. You know. For you, as as you studied this great man, that many of us have loved, uh, what did you find most admirable about? Now, what do you find most admirable about T.R. Given the the work you've done about Roosevelt. You know, I got to say, and, and of course, many, many others uh, have said this as well. And this is what uh, has, has drawn me to him uh, from the first time I began to read him Pringles. You know, Pringles biography, I think. Uh, uh, and that is just his sheer um, love of being alive, uh, and just that, uh, just that, <laughs> that, that, uh, that absolutely irresistible sense of energy uh, and power. Uh, uh, that um, uh, it's very, very, very hard uh, to resist. You know, uh, what is it Ida Tarbell said about him? Uh, she set a few seats down from him at a concert. You ever heard that story? Yeah. She said she had the feeling that he was about to explode out of his clothes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, it's that sense of energy. Um, uh, but just this sort of a joy of combat, uh, joy of um, uh, joy of the chase. <laughs> the um, uh, dear, dear friend, uh, Willard Gatewood, uh, one of my uh, colleagues uh, died last Sunday, uh, memorial service tomorrow, with a book called Theodore Roosevelt and the Art of Controversy. Uh, and Willard uh, would make that point. You know, this guy, you know, uh, controversy fights, you know, that was just uh, his lifeblood. Uh, and that was part of this larger phenomenon of him, that he uh, just sort of loved being alive. Uh, and I think that's what, that's what I admire most. Oh, go ahead. Other thoughts? Yes, here. So healing. Yes, I think so. I think so. I think that's really, uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately, I think that's what you have to look for most of all in terms of what um, what happened to him uh, when he when he was out here. But I mean, kind of emerging in your talk, and particularly during the Q and A session, is a sense that Roosevelt had a certain type of genius for keeping his soul open over time. You know, he, uh, these other guys that you mentioned are not well, very well known historically. They didn't lead the United States. Uh, they're not world historical figures, however important they might have been in 1885. Mm -hmm. But Roosevelt didn't flame out. He didn't plateau out because he had that capacity to keep seeing experience and working his way through it and finding, staying with a certain set of core values but not over applying them to situations? Yes, right, sure. He was, you know, a couple of things to say about that. First of all, of course, that's, um, you know, that's the essence of a good politician. Uh, the second thing is, you know, the, the point I, I made um, at the outset, and that is he had this, if he had a touch of genius, it was, it was the ability to sort of identify with where the public was moving. Uh, and in most cases, in fact, to stay a bit ahead of them. Uh, that's where, you know, that's what I see in him, is, is in these changes. What he's really, what you really are seeing here is seeing uh, this man as a revelation of, of how America is moving, uh, of, of this newer America as it's, as it's emerging. Uh, you know, that's about as invaluable, that's about as valuable an ability and a political figure as you can have. Um, but it also, of course, makes him this, uh, this exactly what you were saying, this someone who stays open to the changes that are going on around him and reflects them uh, and, and, and leads them. The ability to reflect that, you know, to reflect those changes, but at the same time to stay a bit in front and to pull America along with him. And, you know, back when he was here in the Haymarket 
riots occurred. Yes. He said we should take some of our ranchers and we'll, we'll deal with this problem and shoot some of these people. Very conventional anti-labor views as a young yes. man, but they changed radically yes. over time. Yes, yes. Same thing, yeah. Time for just one or two more, yes. I'm going to have a contrarian point of view, so it may not be a question, but uh, I think Roosevelt uh, is a figure uh, standing out amongst almost any other figure in American history. We could say that his views on many important things, and many sensitive things like race and labor and immigration did not change so much through the years. There's a book up top there that says you can take statements from his career, from his speeches and letters and articles, and mask the date. And very often you can't tell whether they're from the 1880s or 90s or the last years of his life. And the winning of the West, he wrote about um, massacres and said that the whites very often committed as many massacres, yes. massacres yes. as the Indians did. The last speech he wrote in his life that he didn't believe it. it's his birthday today, and this was, I think, read on the day that he died. He wrote it, couldn't deliver it, but he talked about immigration and the fear that America was becoming a powerful boarding house. And in your view, that he evolved from these, you never used the word of your whole speech, but obviously you're calling him a racist. Well, <laughs> but everyone else was, so, yes. so if that's. What he was, what he was saying. Anyway, I don't think I don't think he did evolve that much. I think he was very consistent. I don't think all his views were as regrettable through the crucible and the way mm -hmm. he maybe should otherwise see them. But I don't see all the evolution in a lot of these matters. Suggestion of more stasis yeah. rather than evolution yes, of his right, thinking. Right. Uh, a couple of points on that. On, in writing in the winning of the West, and Patty Limmer is going to be talking on that, uh, I guess, on Saturday. Um, uh, he does. He does say that. He does say it. You know that there were there were things done on both sides. Uh, there's a wonderful letter in which he he talks about uh, talks about chastising Nelson Miles for wounded knee. Uh, uh, for wounded knee, yeah. yeah. Uh, Miles had come to complain about that. Said there had been reports of massacres in the Philippines. He said, "Well, there was nothing what you guys did out there to <laughs> wounded knee, where where Miles was in control." Yes, uh, he did something. But if you look at those on ballots. I think he sees that, and again, it's part of the sort of a common trope of that time. Yes, yes, things were done by both sides, but clearly, you know, clearly it is the Indians who are, you know, the, who, who are the ones who are most responsible for this, uh, and clearly they are the ones who must give way. That, you know, that's what you see in something like the winning of the West. On the question of polyglot boarding house, uh, that's, I think, can be, those kinds of statements can be quite misleading. Because what he's saying there is still quite different from what people like Grant and others those racial theorists are saying. Uh, they're saying that these people c will never change and that these are irreconcilable differences among these people. What, when Roosevelt is talking about in that, in that comment about the polygot boarding house, something else he also says in, the, in, in an article in the, in the 1890s, what he's saying is uh, that we must do all we can uh, to encourage these people to engage in this. Uh, and if we do, and over time, this will happen. You know, this transformation will happen. That's the position, at least in my reading of him, that he comes that he comes around to uh, by those last years. Uh, he's saying we need to be careful. You know, uh, that these what he calls these perversities of holding on to these old world ways. You know, are resisted, uh, and do all we can then to uh, to do it, to facilitate this. But it will happen. Uh, you know, he's he's really quite clear on that point. Uh, this 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 amalgam, this uh, this melting pot will ultimately will work, yeah. Elliot, I wish we could go on and on, take a break, maybe come back and pummel you for a while. And, sure. But, but what I want to do, we're going to have Sharon Kilzer come up for a moment. There will be a book signing immediately after, but I'm glad you mentioned, of course, that it is Theodore Roosevelt's birthday. I think we should sing happy birthday to the President of the United <laughs> States. So are you ready? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. Roosevelt. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Cool. Dr. Elliot West.